Hello guys, right then today uh, we're going to take you way back, real old school on today's video. Um, have a think about ways that you store computer information today, you know, SD cards, flash drives, SSDs, uh, even Blu-ray discs. I'm going to take you back to a time way before any of that when the main preferred storage medium on personal computers was these bad boys, the five and a quarter inch floppy disk, and they really were floppy as well. Now, she quite amused me the other day. I had a few of these lying around in my uh, home office here. Uh, my girlfriend, who I live with, uh, she's 24 years old. She came in and she was like, what are those black things there? She'd never seen one before in her life. And I'm only like, you know, five or six years older than her, not too much, but then I was really shocked. I was like, really, you've never seen these before? She knows what three and a half inch discs are. But then, you know, I've got like nieces and nephews and stuff who are, uh, or younger cousins, should I say, who are kind of, you know, in their uh, early teens and stuff, they don't even know what cassette tapes or videotapes are. So that really proves how quickly storage methods have moved on throughout the years. So today I thought we'd have a little look about um, using five and a quarter inch floppy disks. I'll show you a few of my uh, classic Commodore floppy disk drives. And I'll talk a bit about getting software on and off floppy disks in the year 2013. All right, now on my uh, secondary desk today, I've got my Commodore Plus 4 computer. Uh, all set up. This is kind of a typical uh, plus four setup, a Commodore plus four from 1984 uh, with the Commodore 1551 floppy disk drive. Now this is actually quite a rare floppy drive. We'll have a look at it a little bit more in depth in a moment. And next to it is uh, the very famous Commodore 1541 drive. Now uh, they look quite similar. However, there are some quite big differences between them. Uh, this model here, the 1541, um, as you might be able to tell from the uh, kind of brown beigey color of it, was uh, designed for the Breadbox original Commodore 64. And uh, I think it worked on the VIC-20 as well, actually. Uh, this one was a more customized drive specifically for the uh, Commodore Plus 4 and the uh, 16 and the 116. Although uh, it was never really a very popular drive, actually. Over here, you know, in Europe, which was really the only place that the Commodore Plus 4 and the 16 had any sales, a preferred method of storage, uh, really due to the... Uh, you know, the inexpensiveness of them uh, was the data set, which used cassette tapes. So uh, I've got my Plus 4 hooked up to a uh, flat screen TV here. For ease of filming it, generally I'd never play this machine on a uh, on an LCD screen, but you know, I thought for this it would be a little bit easier to film. So I'm going to unhook the disk drives and we'll have a little look around the, uh, the ports and the way they work. Right, first of all, I thought we'd have a look at the uh, very common Commodore 1541 floppy disk drive. Now, uh, this was the uh, drive that was really popular with the Commodore 64, and it, you know, it sold in massive numbers, really. Now, <laughs> these things are absolutely massive. I'm going to pan up a little bit, so it's a bit hard to fit it all in on camera. I had to move my keyboard back. Now, you might remember, if you watched my video about using SD cards, I showed you my uh, SD card reader that was styled to look like a Commodore 1541, and here it is in comparison. <laughs> look at that. Yeah, it is a lot smaller. These drives are absolutely huge. Now, in the front of it there, we have a standard 5.25-inch uh, uh, floppy disk drive that accommodates the disks. You put them in there, and this has got a um, kind of a clamping mechanism, so you've got to push that down, and that clicks into place. It goes forward. Uh, to release the disks on it, it's just a case of uh, pushing that at the top there, and the disk will pop out. Now, I think there were a few different variants of it. You could get them with latches as well as that. But then uh, we'll have a little look around the side of the drive. I hope I can get all this in on camera. So the side of it, there's not much on it. It's just uh, kind of stylized to match the look of the Breadbox Commodore 64. On the top of the drive, uh, we've got the Commodore logo here and some grills here for cooling. So it do get really warm, actually. And every Commodore floppy disk drive I've owned does this for some reason. Run your fingers across the grills and you get that high-pitched squeak. Very strange. Uh, and on the back of it here, we've got a a few ports on the back. There's not really many on this drive, actually. So we have the um, the kettle lead adapter, as it's generally known, the three-prong uh, adapter. The power supply is actually contained inside here, which is why it's quite big, actually, the PSU is built in. So it takes a standard power cable and needs its own. We've got an on-off switch on here as well. And uh, we have two serial ports here as well. Now, uh, this is a serial interface on this. So you uh, take a cable, connect it from there, straight into the serial port on your Commodore computer, and then it's got a pass-through as well, 
which means you can also hook in either a second drive or uh, one of the Commodore MPS printers, for example, that use the serial connection. Uh, there's also a fuse here as well, um, as these devices are actually fused. So there's a bit of protection built into them as well. And, you know, I actually think these models are quite reliable. So, uh, you know, this has been in, um, in use now for a good, what must be over 30 years old, this drive. Uh, still working great as well. So uh, let's look around the Commodore 1541. All right then, and now we come on to the uh, darling of my Commodore floppy disk drive collection, the Commodore 1551 drive. Now, physically, it might look pretty similar to the 1541. You know, stylistically, it's pretty much the same apart from the uh, the badge and also the uh, black casing, which were designed to fit in with the uh, Commodore 264 uh, range of machines. Now, looking around it, it actually looks, you know, virtually identical. You've got the floppy disk drive here that is, you know, the same as the one in the 1541. Single-sided, 170k drive uh, that takes five and a quarter inch floppy disk drives. Uh, this particular one has got a latch on it, though, rather than the, the clamping mechanism. I think, you know, that kind of varied depending on what kind of drives they had in stock that week. Um, you've also got the uh, Commodore logo on the top there as well. Just like the um, the 1541, and yes, it does make the sound. There we go. Uh, now the back is where things look a little bit different. So let's pop that down there. Now again, it connects via the uh, the kettle three prong lead there. Uh, you've got the fuse and also the uh, power switch on the back as well. Now you'll notice there are no serial ports. Instead, we have a wire that is emanating from the back of the casing, and then it leads into this rather large adapter. Now uh, this is a parallel interface. This drive itself, I mean all Commodore floppy disk drives really are intelligent drives. This has actually got a uh, 6510 processor on board in this drive. The same CPU that you'll find in the Commodore 64. So that's how intelligent these drives are. They've basically got their own computer on board. And uh, this connector here actually drag jacks straight into the user port uh, the expansion port rather on the uh, 264 machine so the Commodore 16, the Plus 4, the 116 and uh, that means that by going into that port it can actually address the uh, computer's address space directly it maps itself straight into RAM so uh, it can be manipulated directly from the computer so that means it's a lot quicker by using this interface actually these drives are around five to six times quicker than the uh, serial port on the 1541 so they're really quick drives uh, and actually these were planned to be used as adapters. So th there's going to be an adapter to allow you to use this on the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20, I believe. They never got released, so uh, unfortunately um, they only actually work on the 264 range of machines, which didn't really sell all that well. And uh, for some reason the plastic on these drives, I've read, is a lot more brittle than the plastic on the 1541. So, uh, most of these drives today have either got, you know, the, the grills are all smashed off or, uh, you know, they've got kind of bits of plastic or cracks in them somewhere. So I think not only is finding a working example of these drives rare enough in itself, but finding one in, you know, this kind of condition. Mine is virtually mint. There's not a mark on it. I think mine is probably one of the few remaining in the world that actually look this good and actually work fine to this day. So uh, I'm going to hook this drive up and we'll have a little look at some of the uh, commands for using the 1551. All right, now hopefully you'll excuse the slightly weird angle I've got going on here. I want to get the floppy disk drive and the screen kind of all in one, so hopefully you can see it from that weird angle. Now, I've got a floppy disk here. Now, the good thing about these disks is that even though the drive is only single-sided, um, you can actually get double-sided disks, or you can make your own, really, if you've got a, uh, a notching tool, it was called, to cut a second notch out. Then you can use each uh, side of the disk as uh, independent disks, which is pretty cool. So I'll pop this into the uh, 1551 drive. We'll latch it down. You can hear the drive spin up. Actually, my drive, I'm not sure whether this is commonplace, but it kind of, it spins up whenever you get any activity nearby, so it's quite there. Even before the disc is fully inserted, it realizes. So, anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. I don't think my 1541 drive does that. Now, in uh, version 3.5 of Commodore Basic, it's actually got some specific uh, disc-based commands, so I can press F3 on the keyboard for a directory. You see the drive is reading there, and we get a list of all the files on it. So uh, there's a group of games on there that I've got as PRG files. Now this is really cool because, you know, on this disc I've got like, you know, about 10 games there. On a uh, cassette tape system, you'd normally get, you know, one of those on each cassette, and it would take you around 5 to 10 minutes to load each game. 
Whereas on this, um, I can press F2, that will do deload, which is a, a disk command in Commodore Basic 3.5. Let's say I want to play, for example, uh, Exorcist. So we'll do EX, then we can do a little uh, wildcard, comma, searching the drive for it, activity lights on. And my game is now ready to play. Run. And there we go, the game is on. Now, yeah, that would have taken around 10, 15 minutes to load on a uh, on a cassette, if I remember correctly, this game, actually. So uh, we can then play the game. If I had a joystick plugged at the right port. There we go. And also, the uh, Commodore Plus 4 came with built-in software as well, the uh, a word processor and spreadsheet, which required a floppy disk drive to be present. So, uh, you know, it was kind of cool for that as well. There were actually a few uh, disk-based games that were released for the Commodore Plus 4. Um, like Winter Events and Summer Events by Udo Gertz. Now, these games were, you know, probably some of the best that were ever released on the Commodore Plus 4. They were kind of, you know, multi-part games that if you had them on cassette tape, you would have to, uh, you know, press play and keep waiting for each part of the game to load separately. It took forever. Off a disk drive, though, it was actually quite playable. So there we go, the game title screen comes on. You can see it's loading this game in parts now. And there's a quite a cool uh, opening ceremony with music that was... Uh, kind of goes into the Dallas theme if you leave it long enough, actually. So we'll skip past that by... Uh, pressing on... The, oh, we have to wait a bit, I think, till he lights it. There we go, now we can skip past that and the game will continue loading. So uh, even though these kind of multi-part games were quite rare on the uh, Commodore Plus 4 series of machines, there were quite a few more that were released for the Commodore 64. So uh, I'll also show you some demos that used what were known as F uh, turbo loaders as well. Um, that actually got you a bit more speed out the drive. So if I look through my uh, disc collection here, here, we've got one called Demos here. So I'll pop this in. We'll do a directory. This one's called, uh, I think it's Amiga Mania or something I think it's called. The title was actually written in it there. Yeah, Amiga Mania. Uh, now, often demos, the uh, the demo scene in Europe, uh, that was quite big over here, um, they would release games with track loaders on them, turbo loaders that would in improve the loading time of games, but they had to be written specifically for each kind of drive. So you'd often get two versions of them, either a 1541 version or a 1551 version of them. And uh, for some reason the turbo loaders weren't compatible between each device, so... That did kind of cause a little bit of a messy scene on the, uh, the Commodore Plus 4 back in the day. And some of that cool uh, Ted Chip music going on there, which and even, even though it got slated back in the day, you know, it could actually produce some pretty decent sound for 1984, I thought. It wasn't up there with the SID chip, but it wasn't bad. Right then, we've got the F1541 drive hooked up now. Um, rather than me moving the Commodore 64 over here, I've got it plugged into the Plus 4 as well. Um, it works equally as well on uh, either machine, so uh, I thought, you know, we'd have a little comparison maybe so uh, I'll pop a disk into this drive and uh, we'll have a look at the the contents of it same disk so let's try loading the exorcist game again see if there is a much of a speed difference see the lights on there this drive actually sounds a bit quieter than my 1551 Now we've got a serial cable connecting these, so uh, I think the other driver loaded it by now. Whereas this one's still whirring away. There we go, done. And the game works. Um, you know, I didn't think there was a huge difference in that particular example, but when you get to uh, multi 
park games, for example, you know, like uh, winter events and summer events, you do definitely notice the difference between the drives. So, you know, these are still very reliable drives, I think, after all this time, particularly the 1541. I mean, this was kind of the, uh, the disc drive of its generation, really. It was one of the first affordable uh, drives for the home user on uh, Commodore machines. So um, even though these days they don't get a lot of use by me, uh, I'm more into using SD cards now because uh, I can put, you know, an 8 gigabyte SD card in and have pretty much any Commodore software for all my machines that I'd ever want. But, you know, it's still kind of nice to have the authentic experience of using these old air drives again every now and then. So that's been a quick look at Commodore disk drives in operation. What I'm going to quickly show you before the end of this video now is how to transfer software uh, that you may have downloaded onto the Commodore 1541 drive. Right then, for this part of the video, we're actually on the floor uh, underneath my desk, which is not somewhere I show you very often, because it's a uh, friggin' mess down here. But um, underneath the table on my secondary desk, I've actually got this old uh, P4PC that I keep around with uh, Windows XP installed on it. And you might be thinking, what on earth do you want an XP machine for in this day and age? Well, this mach machine has actually saved my ass a couple of times recently. Um, because it's got a few ports that my uh, modern Core i7 uh, Windows 8 PC hasn't got, including a parallel port. Now, that's the thing that we're going to need for the next bit of this video. I've got a cable here with a parallel connection, and then on the end of it is a serial adapter for the 1541 floppy drive. Now, this cable, I believe, is called an XM1541. You can either make these yourself, the uh, schematics are online, there are a few different variants of it, but I found this one works very well for me. Or well, you can buy it. I think there was a retailer on eBay. I bought this cable for about seven or eight pounds, it was. It wasn't very much. So all you do is literally pop that into your parallel port on your PC and then that into the back of the drive. And then we can use a nifty bit of software to uh, transfer files to and from the 1541. Now, you'll have to forgive me the uh, the messiness of my Windows desktop here. I literally only ever use this machine for copying files to and from. Other systems really are serving files or watching videos. I don't really use it all that often. So uh, what you need actually is uh, two bits of software to do this. I've got my 1541 drive and the cable hooked up. Then you need to download something called OpenCBM. And then to make life a little bit easier for yourself, you'll want G uh, GUI for CBM as well. Now, if we open this directory, um, I've unarchived everything into here. Uh, the drivers are installed really simply. Just follow the instructions. And then if you open the uh, GUI for CBM, that will then allow you to manipulate the Commodore drive using the mouse directly from your uh, your Windows desktop. So uh, what we'll do is I'll pop in, uh, for example, this disk that I was looking at on my uh, on my Commodore Plus 4 a moment ago. So we'll just slot that into the 1541 under the table. That's in there now. Now I should click directory and it'll read the disk. And the drive activity light is on, on the 1541. And there we go, that gives me the uh, directory reading of the disk. So, uh, now say I want to copy something to or from it. If I want to copy, uh, for example, let's go to the desktop, let's copy the, uh, the Exorcist game. If I want to copy it onto my Windows PC, it's literally as easy as clicking that, selecting your destination, and then copying it over. And it's a pretty respectable speed, actually, considering it's a, a 30-year-old drive going from serial to parallel on a Windows machine. So there we go, that's been copied over now. If we look on my Windows desktop, there it is. Now with this software as well, you can also uh, format disks, you can um, rename files, delete them from the disk. Uh, you can also copy things that you've downloaded, for example, PRG files, you can copy them um, say, say for example, I'll copy that back. We'll, we'll scratch that from the disk. That's gone now, and now I'll, uh, I'll copy it back. Even though my disk is full now, but yeah, <laughs> it generally would work properly. I think it probably has gone on though, even though the disk is now full. Yeah, there we are. It was to capacity, but yeah, we just got it on, I think. And you can also, one really cool thing, if you've got um, demos, for example, that you want to do, you can uh, 
you want to use. You can actually write D64 files directly to the disk. Uh, I won't do that because I don't know to overwrite this disk. It took me a while to put all the files on. But So there you go. This, uh, this software is called um, GUI for CBM. And the software that you need to drive that is OpenCBM. I'll put links in the video description below. So there you are. That's uh, a little example of my Commodore floppy disk drives and how to transfer software between them. Um, and hopefully you found it interesting. I'll put my links below for Google Plus and Twitter and my new website, my new blog you can find. Uh, that's all in the video description. Thank you for watching. I'll see you again soon.